From the NASDAQ market side, a conversation with Security and Exchange Commissioner Hester Peirce, uh, known in the crypto community as Crypto Mom. Now, what in the world should we do about cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, perhaps a multi-trillion dollar question? So while the SEC tries to sort things out, I've got Commissioner Peirce with us here for this discussion on the business of blockchain. Welcome, it's great to have you here. Thank you, it's so nice to be here. And I should say that the views that I represent are my own and not necessarily those of the commissioner or my fellow commissioners. Okay, so let's start with the nickname, Crypto Moms. Where did that come from? Uh, about a year ago, we were considering whether to approve an exchange-traded product that was based on Bitcoin as an underlying. And uh, my colleagues decided not to uh, approve that product. And I wrote a dissent uh, suggesting that we should, have, we should have approved it and um, calling into question some of the rationale underlying that denial by my colleagues. And so um, in the wake of that, I was dubbed crypto yeah, mom. So what were their arguments and what were your arguments for that ETF? Uh, so their arguments against the ETF getting approved were that there was manipulation in the underlying market for Bitcoin and there was a concern about how that would affect an exchange, the exchange traded product. Um, my response to that was, under, looking at our statutory framework and the authority that we have, I thought we overstepped our authority in trying to um, dig so deep into the underlying market. Um, there are lots of markets in the world that have segments of them that are manipulated, mm -hmm. but we still build products on top of them and trade those in our securities markets. And we have protections around the products that trade in our securities markets. Um, that are able to, to address some of the concerns that might arise if, there's, if there are problems in the underlying. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I worried more broadly about just what message we were sending to innovators with this denial. Um, are we telling people that our doors are closed and if you have a new idea for a new product, you can't come in? Mm -hmm. um, too often, I think we are risk averse because we're worried that if there's a problem in the markets later, we'll get blamed. Yeah. Uh, and then I think we don't think about investor protection from a really holistic fr uh, perspective. We think more of stopping investors from getting, from buying bad products. But that really isn't our role. Our role is to get information out there for investors to make their own decisions. And then uh, as long as they have enough information, they can decide if they want to buy a product. Now, it may be that this product would have gone to market and no one would have wanted it. Um, other people have come in with similar applications and, and have taken quite a different approach to how they structure the product. And so I don't want to make a decision about which product is best and which might be good for which investor. I want to let that be open to investors and let them choose. Let the marketplace decide mm -hmm. that. Now, in the year, you said there's about a year ago that that was cited. Do you think things have changed? Have we become, uh, there's been a lot happening in this space. Do you think an ETF might get approved today or has there been progress made? Well, I would be surprised if it happened today, but uh, <laughs> you never know on, on timing. A lot of these decisions are made at the staff level, and then they only percolate up to us. Okay. Um, there are different ways they can percolate up. But, uh, you know, the staff is still continuing to get applications and to look at them based on their facts and circumstances and um, processing new information, meeting with lots of people. And so, you know, I'm hopeful that at some point uh, the staff will be more comfortable in this space. But there are also a lot of other issues around crypto and how we regulate it um, and around blockchain and how we regulate it that, that are taking up a lot of staff time. Now, I, especially at the end of 2017, was asked a lot about Bitcoin. What is it? I mean, when this was when it was making news every day. How do you explain Bitcoin to people? Well, I define it as, I mean, different people define it in different ways, but I think it's, it's, it's the currency of the internet. Mm -hmm. So one, one piece of the internet that was kind of missing is this currency to go with it. And so in some ways you can think of it as that. You can think of it as a store of value, as something sort of akin to, to gold. So there are different ways that you can think about it, but it is a way for people um, to transact w with one another across international boundaries yes. um, and, and without a fiat currency that has to be converted and, and exactly so it makes all that commerce exactly simpler and easier now of course uh, the technology underlying Bitcoin and, and all the cryptocurrencies is blockchain and uh, that seems to have a lot of promise I mean do you think this could really be as transformative as some people predict it will be 
Yeah, I mean, I think that there are um, potential applications. Now, people differ. Some people say blockchain is nothing other than basically a, a spreadsheet that you, you know, that people are using. It, or maybe you, you permission it, um, and, and then it really looks very much like technology that we've already had in place. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I think allowing uh, allowing for a public blockchain where you can see see the transactions that have occurred, um, especially in a, in a permissionless environment, is really something new. And even in the permissioned environment, I think we will see in our securities markets um, the integration of blockchain into a lot of our standard processes. And I think that will be transformative. But on the permissionless side, I think it, it does open up new ways for people to interact with one another. Uh, without having to know one another or have direct contractual relationships with one another. Well, the decentralization, I think, is a key feature that a lot of people like. I was just having, having a conversation with somebody last night about media. And um, they were like, we really don't like the media too much. And I said, because it's centralized, right? Like, it's a group of people making decisions about what you're going to see or watch or read. And it's kind of the same concept, is they don't like that idea of some entity deciding what they're seeing and reading. And that's really kind of the theory behind blockchain. And I think bringing up media is, is an interesting point because that is a place where we could see this decentralization really transform things. If you can make micro payments to um, an author, uh, a journalist that you, that you like, those are the things that this technology allows and that will perhaps enable people to get paid who wouldn't have gotten paid absent this technology. Yeah, and, and even kind of tracing the evolution of a news story, for example. They can find out who the sources were, and right. you know, where things were written, and in this day of kind of news you know, everywhere, and nobody knows what to trust anymore, that might be a very useful product to have at some yeah, that, point. That's so, an interesting yeah. way to look at it. Um, now, the SEC, any news? What are you be working on, would you say, in 2019 in this area? A lot of the calls that we're getting are for guidance or rulemaking in this area. I, I, you know, I, I would prefer to see some commission level rulemaking to kind of set parameters, maybe a safe harbor. But I think more likely you'll see more guidance. Several weeks ago, one of our divisions at the SEC issued some guidance to think about when you're thinking of an in initial coin offering, whether you've got to do that within the securities framework or not. Um, that's gotten mixed reviews, uh, but I think we'll see some companion guidance coming out of at least one of the other divisions of the SEC. Um, and then we're also getting quite a few applications by broker-dealers, uh, ATSs, um, folks who want to do offerings under Regulation A, which is a way of doing sort of a mini IPO. Yeah. And so we've, we've been seeing these applicants come in, and I think this coming year will be a, a pivotal year for those applications. That's interesting because that's kind of a whole new way for companies to raise capital is through the ICOs, and I know that people are going more to STOs now instead of ICOs, but in the Reg A, I mean, all that is allowing smaller companies to be able to have the capital to grow and expand. They don't have to have the IPO or big venture fund behind them anymore. Yeah, and there are questions about how well this will work, especially since we haven't approved any at this point. Um, but, you know, and there are questions about whether it's the most effective way for a small enterprise to raise capital. But I think it, if we can get it to work, if we can if we can get some of these Reg A offerings approved, I think it'll show a path to folks that they haven't had in the past. Yeah. So this is kind of a work in progress, it sounds it like. It is very much a work in progress, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so is I ICOs, are they dead, would you say, in the US? I don't think so, although this the guidance that, that came out recently has raised a lot of concerns among the, the, the legal community. Um, so I think it has made it more difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was a little Wild West there for a while, but I, I know more going to the security, the, the tokenized. Yeah, I mean, the Wild West aspect was definitely there. There are a lot of people throwing their money into this space um, without thinking very carefully about who they were giving their money to. And that has sort of naturally also paired itself back as people start to think, wait a minute, these guys aren't spending the money the way they said they were. And so it's cause people to ask more questions on their own. And then we've brought some enforcement cases, which have also, I think, sent the message that yes. if you're out there doing an offering, or, or especially if you're doing a fraudulent offering, um, we're looking at you. Yeah, sure. Um, now, Bitcoin and Ethereum, those are, are um, 
not considered securities, right? It's commodities, I mean, how would you classify that in terms of an asset class? Well, I, you know, there have been pronouncements by, by the staff and by the chairman of the SEC um, regarding Bitcoin and, and Ethereum. I have chosen not to speak about any particular um, cryptocurrency or digital asset, um, but there are those statements out there. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of cryptocurrencies out there, so they all, I guess, kind of have to figure out where they land in yes. terms of, of digital assets, and there's some that you could argue are utility and some are security, and so each one might be judged, I guess, on an individual basis when it's all And I think that. that's precisely the point, yeah. which is what makes it difficult, not only for the people who are trying to raise money um, using an ICO, but also for the platforms that might consider whether they should trade them. Now, there have been a lot of well-publicized hacks into uh, different exchanges and, and different you know, funds. Um, is there progress being made on Is this something the public should be worried about? Well, I think the public should always worry about where they're, who, to whom they're entrusting their money. Um, and, you know, I think hacks are occurring in many parts of our economy, That's so right. it's not surprising that Credit really, hacks. exactly, yeah. and really sophisticated uh, tech, people who know technology really well are engaged in this space, so it isn't surprising that there's some hacking. Um, that said, I think the very public nature of some of these events and pretty dramatic nature of some of these events has caused the um, folks in the space to think very carefully about how they can protect themselves and to take steps, whether it's insuring themselves or you know, putting in more safeguards. And so, as in any space, a bad incident can be a real catalyst toward better practices and uh, more careful practices. Yeah. And we really don't know when some of these companies are, you know, have their credit card information hacked, we really never truly know who did it. it seems like there's right. suspicions, right. but it's still, I just think that's part of the digital economy, that protecting yourself is the key. It is, and, and I think we have to work together as a regulator. We have concerns about security of the data that we collect, and we have concerns about our regulated entities, and we need to work together uh, because we all have a common goal of mm -hmm. making sure that people's information is protected. Sure. Um, now, in terms of what's going on in Washington, do you feel like Congress, do you feel like the senators and the representatives are starting to get blockchain? What's going on there? Are there, are there meetings? I mean, kind of... Describe the scene to me, what's happening. I think there's a lot of interest on Capitol Hill from, you know, me watching as an outsider, but, but there does seem a lot of interest, um, and there seems to be bipartisan interest in, in understanding the technology and what it might do, uh, and, and seeing whether our regulatory framework mm -hmm. is, is appropriate in this context. Is there a sense that the U.S. is ahead, behind, or about where it needs to be in terms of regulating this technology? I mean, I think there's a sense that we're not working as fast as we could be, and, and that probably is partly a function of the fact that we have a pretty old securities framework, mm. and that framework is a little creaky as it adjusts to new technology, and I think we're seeing that play out here. And, and you, in a space where you've got a lot of young people who have a lot of energy and enthusiasm, um, it's particularly frustrating. Well, I'm sure, yeah. I mean, if the government could probably benefit from some blockchain technology at some point. Uh, yeah, some and, operations. And I and think that's a really good point, too, is we're also, you know, one piece is thinking about how to regulate it. The other is thinking, are there ways that we can incorporate this and use it ourselves in, in the job that we're trying to do? So um, as you go to Capitol Hill as a leader, a thought leader, and kind of an industry leader in this area, what kind of things will you be looking for, pushing for? What are your goals, would you say, in the next one to three years? I mean, my goal is to help to see if we can get some more legal clarity for folks so that they feel comfortable thinking more about the, the technology than about the legal framework, because I don't really want all of this energy to be spent on thinking about legal frameworks when it can be put into the actual substance. So that would be my, my primary goal. You know, I, I think this is a good test case for how we handle innovation more broadly. And so I would like to see my regulatory agency and other regulators figure out a way to really grapple with innovation in a way that's productive, that's fast enough um, so that we can kind of keep up but is also um, not picking winners and losers. Okay. That's really up to the market. Yeah. Well, that's a hard 
needle to thread because you've got these ex tech entrepreneurs that are so excited and they're super smart and they have these amazing ideas and then you have regulars like, whoa, slow down a little bit. Um, so you have to kind of figure that out because you don't, you don't want people to get hurt, but yet you want to encourage innovation as well in this space. That's exactly the yeah. balance that yeah. we're trying to strike. So what would you say to entrepreneurs as they try to navigate this regulatory framework? You know, I, I would say come talk to us. Tell us about what you're trying to do. Um, we need to learn, and you need to help us learn. And, and, and don't be afraid to come and talk to us okay. um, because we have a lot of people at the agency who care a lot about the markets, um, and they want to learn. They want to. They want to become better at regulating the space. And how would somebody do that? It, can they set up a meeting with you? Are there certain open forums they could attend? So with me, they can always set up a meeting. I love meeting with people, whether it's here uh, in New York or in D.C., um, wherever is convenient for people, San Francisco, um, and then they can they can write into. We have a FinHub, which is the. It's a website, but you can write in there and you can. Um, tell them that you want to come in and meet with okay. the staff. Okay. And then finally, investors who are interested in this space, maybe a little scared about what they saw happen in 2018, what would you say to them? I would say the fear is good. You need to be, you need to be a little bit careful as you tread into this space. So be skeptical. Ask lots of questions. Uh, remember that when you invest money, if you invest it with, uh, you, you may lose it, as in, any, as in, as anything. in anything. That's right. Um, so just use, use your brain, and, um, and it, it's an exciting space to explore, but as, just be careful. Um, and the responsibility is ultimately yours. And if you, if you as an investor find information that you think is lacking, um, and you think there's something that we can be doing, you should come talk to us too. Tell us what you want from mm -hmm. us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Commissioner, for joining us. Very interesting to hear the update. This so, was a pleasure. Thank yes. You very much. And thank you as well for watching the Business of Blockchain. I'm Jane King from the NASDAQ Market Site.